thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we conclude with Part 8, the landmarks of Masonry defined and its universality as a secret society. From the Story of Freemasonry by W. G. Sibley. The landmarks of Masonry defined and its universality as a secret society. Certain characteristics of Freemasonry called landmarks have long been discussed by Masonic authorities, among whom more or less difference of opinion has arisen. These landmarks are certain unchangeable laws. Dr. Mackey says they are those peculiar marks of distinction by which we are separated from the profane world and by which we are able to designate our inheritance as the Sons of Light. The universal language and the universal laws of Masonry are landmarks, but not so are the local ceremonies, laws and usages which vary in different countries. To attempt to alter or remove these sacred landmarks by which we examine and prove a brother's claim to share in our privileges is one of the most heinous offenses that a Mason can commit. There are, however, certain forms and regulations which, although not constituting landmarks, are nevertheless so protected by the venerable claim of antiquity that they should be guarded by every good mason with religious care from alteration. It is not in the power of any body of men to make innovation in masonry. The real landmarks of the order are thus specified by Dr. Mackey. 1. The Modes of Recognition 2. The Division of Symbolic Masonry into Degrees 3. The Legend of the Third Degree 4. The government of the fraternity by a presiding officer called a Grand Master, who is elected from the body of the craft. 5. The prerogative of the Grand Master to preside over every assembly of the craft, wheresoever and whensoever held. 6. The prerogative of the Grand Master to grant dispensations to confer degrees at irregular times. 7. The prerogative of the Grand Master to grant dispensations for opening and holding lodges. 8. The prerogative of the Grand Master to make Masons at sight. 9. The necessity for Masons to congregate in lodges. 10. The government of every lodge by a master and wardens. 11. The necessity that every lodge, when congregated, should be duly tiled. 12. The right of every mason to be represented in all general meetings of the craft and to instruct his representatives. 13. The right of every mason to appeal from the decision of his brethren in lodge convened to the Grand Lodge or to a General Assembly of Masons. 14. The right of every mason to visit and sit in every regular lodge. 15. That no visitor not known to some brother present as a mason, can enter a lodge without undergoing examination. 16. That no lodge can interfere in the business or labor of another lodge. 17. That every Freemason is amenable to the laws and regulations of the Masonic jurisdiction in which he resides, and this although he may not be a member of any lodge. 18 that every candidate for initiation must be a man, freeborn, and of lawful age. 19. That every Mason must believe in the existence of God as the grand architect of the universe. 20. That every Mason must believe in the resurrection to a future life. 21. That a book of the law of God must constitute an indispensable part of the furniture of every lodge. 22 that all men in the sight of God are equal and meet in the lodge on one common level. 23. That Freemasonry is a secret society in possession of secrets that cannot be divulged. 24. That Freemasonry consists of a speculative science founded on speculative art. 25. That the landmarks of Masonry can never be changed. The universality of the landmarks and of the institution itself was ably and eloquently 
set forth by Charles Whitlock Moore of Massachusetts in 1856 at the centennial anniversary of St. Andrew's Lodge in Boston. He said, I suppose it to be entirely true in view of the great accessions that have been made to its members within the last two or three years that there are many persons present who entertain, at best, but a general and indefinite idea of the antiquity, extent, and magnitude of our institution, and that it is equally true that many, even of our most intelligent and active young brethren, not having their attention drawn to the subject, overlook its history and the extent of its influence, and naturally come to regard it in much the same light that they do the ordinary associations of the day, and this, as naturally leads to indifference. Masonry, like every other science, whether moral or physical, to be rightly esteemed must be understood in all its relations and conditions. The intelligent Mason values it in the extent ratio that he has investigated its history and studied its philosophy. But my immediate purpose is not to discuss the importance of the study of Masonry as a science, but to show its universality as a fraternity. This will necessarily involve to some extent the history of its rise and progress. In the beginning of the 15th century, Henry VI of England asked of our brethren of that day, where did Masonry begin, and being told that it began in the East, his next inquiry was, who did bring it westerly? And he received for answer that it was brought westerly by the Phoenicians. These answers were predicated not on archaeological investigations, for the archaeology of masonry had not been opened, but on the traditions of the order, as they have been transmitted from generation to generation and from a period running so far back along the stream of time that it had been lost in the mist and obscurity of the mythological ages. Recent investigations, guided by more certain lights and more extensive and clearer developments of historical truth, have shown that these brethren were not misled by their traditions and that their answers indicated with remarkable precision what the most learned of our brethren in this country and in Europe at the present time believed to be the true origin of their institution. Freemasonry was originally a fraternity of practical builders, architects, and artificers. This is conceded by all who are to any extent acquainted with its history or its traditions. The Phoenicians, whose capital cities were Tyre and Sidon, were the early patrons of this semi-religious mystic fraternity or society of builders, known in history as the Dionysian Architects that this fraternity was employed by the Tarians and Sidonians in the erection of costly temples to unknown deities, in the building of rich and gorgeous palaces, and in strengthening and beautifying their cities is universally admitted that they were the cunning workmen sent by Hiram, king of Tyre, to aid King Solomon in the erection of the temple on Mount Moriah is scarcely less certain. Their presence in that city at the time of the building of the temple is the evidence of history, and Hiram, the widow's son, to whom Solomon entrusted the superintendence of the workmen, as an inhabitant of Tyre and as a skilled architect and cunning and curious workman, was doubtless one of their number. Hence, we are scarcely claiming too much for our order when we suppose that the Dionysians were sent by Hiram, king of Tyre, to assist King Solomon in the construction of the house he was about to dedicate to Jehovah and that they were communicated to their Jewish fellow laborers a knowledge of the advantages of their fraternity and invited them to a participation in its mysteries and privileges. The Jews was neither architects nor artificers. By Solomon's own admission, they were not even skilled enough in the art of building to cut and prepare the timber in the forest of Lebanon, and hence he was compelled to employ the Sidonians to do the work for them. The Tarians, says a learned foreign brother, were celebrated artists. Solomon, therefore, unable to find builders of superior skill for the execution of his plans, in his own dominions, engaged Tarians, 
who with the assistance of the zealous Jews who contented themselves in performing the inferior labor, finished that stupendous edifice, and we are told on the authority of Josephus that the temple of Jerusalem was built on the same plan, in the same style, and by the same architects as the temple of Hercules and Astarte at Tyre. They were doubtless all three built by one of the companies of Dionysian architects, who at that time were numerous throughout Asia Minor, where they possessed the exclusive privilege of erecting temples, theaters, and other public buildings. Dionysius arrived in Greece from Egypt about 1,500 years before Christ, and there instituted or introduced the Dionysian Mysteries. The Ionic Migration occurred about 300 years afterwards, or 1,200 years BC. The immigrants carrying with them from Greece to Asia Minor, the Mysteries of Dionysius, before they had been corrupted by the Athenians. In a short time, says Mr. Lari, the Asiatic colonies surpassed the mother country in prosperity and science. Sculpture in marble, Doric and Ionic orders were the results of their ingenuity. We know, says a learned encyclopedist, that the Dionysiacs of Ionia, which place, according to Herodotus, always been celebrated for the genius of its inhabitants, were a great company of architects and engineers who undertook and even monopolized the building of temples, stadiums, and theaters, precisely as the fraternity of masons are known to have. In the Middle Ages, monopolized the building of cathedrals and conventual churches. Indeed, the Dionysiacs resembled the mystical fraternity, now called Freemasons, in many important particulars. They allowed no strangers to interfere in their employment, recognized each other by signs and tokens. They professed certain mysterious doctrines under the tuition and tutelage of Bacchus, and they called all other men profane, because not admitted to these mysteries. The testimony of history is that they supplied Ionia and the surrounding country, as far as the Hellespont, with theatrical apparatus, by contract. They also practiced their art in Syria, Persia, and India, and about 300 years before the birth of Christ, a considerable number of them were incorporated by the command of the king of Pergamum, who assigned to them Tiwaz as a settlement. It was this fraternity, whether called Greeks, Tarians, or Phoenicians, who built the temple at Jerusalem. That stupendous work, under God, was the result of their genius and scientific skill. And this being true, from them are we, a fraternity, literally descended, or our antiquity is a myth, and that our traditions a fable. Hence the answer of our English brethren of the 15th century, to the inquiry of Henry VI that masonry was brought westerly by the Phoenicians, indicated with great accuracy the probable origin of the institution. They might indeed have said to him that long interior to the advent of Christianity, the mountains of Judea and the plains of Syria, the deserts of India and the valleys of the Nile were cheered by the presence and enlivened by its song, that more than a thousand years before the coming of the Son of Man, a little company of cunning workmen from the neighboring city of Tyre were assembled on the pleasant Mount Moriah at the call of the wise king of Israel, and there erected out of their great skill a mighty edifice, whose splendid and unraveling perfection, and whose grandeur and sublimity might have been the admiration and theme of all succeeding ages. They might have said to him that this was the craft work of a fraternity whose genius and discoveries, and to whose matchless skill and ability, the wisest of men in all ages have bowed with respect. They might have also said to him that, having finished that great work and filled all Judea with temples and palaces and walled cities, having enriched and beautified Azur, Gozara, and Palmyra with the results of their genius, these cunning workmen in after times passing through the Essenian associations and finally issuing out of the mystic halls of the Collegia Artificum of Rome, 
burst upon the dark ages of the world like a bright star peering through a black cloud and under the patronage of the church, produced these splendid monuments of genius which set at defiance the highest attainment of modern art, and, if in addition to all this, they had said to him that in the year AD 926, one of his predecessors of the throne of England had invited them from all parts of the continent to meet him in general assembly at his royal city of York. The answer to his inquiry, who did bring it westerly, would have been complete. Henceforth, for eight centuries, masonry continued an operative fraternity, producing both in England and on the continent those grand and unapproachable specimen of art which are the pride of Central Europe and the admiration of the traveler. But it is no longer an operative association. We of this day, as Masons, set up no pretensions to extraordinary skill in the physical sciences. Very few of us, accomplished Masons as we may be, would willingly undertake to erect another temple on Mount Moriah. Very certain we are that our own honored M.W. Grand Master, Primus Inner Pairs, as all his brethren acknowledge him to be, would hesitate a long time before consenting to assume the duties of architect for another Westminster Abbey or a new St. Paul's number at the recognition of the craft and the establishment of the present Grand Lodge of England in 1717. We laid aside our operative character and with it all pretensions to extraordinary skill in architectural science. We then became a purely moral and benevolent association whose great aim is the development and cultivation of the moral sentiment, the social principle, and the benevolent affections, a higher reverence for God, and a warmer love for man. New laws and regulations adapted to the changed condition of the institution were then made. An entire revolution in its governmental policy took place. Order and system obtained where neither had previously existed and England became the great central point of masonry for the whole world. From this source have lodges grand and subordinate at various times been established and still exist and flourish in France and Switzerland and all the German states save Austria and there at different times and for short seasons and up and down the classic shores of the Rhine in Persia, in Holland, Belgium, Saxony, Hanover, Sweden, Denmark, Russia and even in fallen Poland, in Italy and Spain under the cover of secrecy in various parts of Asia, in Turkey, in Syria, as at Aleppo, where an English lodge was established more than a century ago, in all the East Indian settlements, in Bengal, Bombay, Madras, and all of which lodges are numerous, in China, where there is a provincial grand master and several lodges in various parts of Africa, as at the Cape of Good Hope, and at Sierra Leone, on the Gambia and on the Nile, in the larger islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, as at the Ceylon, Sumatra, St. Helena, Mauritius, Madagascar, the Sandwich Group, and all principal settlements of Australia, as at Adelaide, Melbourne, Parramatta, Sydney, New Zealand, in Greece where there is a Grand Lodge, in Algeria, in Tunis, in the Emperor of Morocco, and wherever else in the old world the genius of civilization has obtained a standpoint, or Christianity has erected the banner of the cross, in all the West Indy Islands, and in various parts of South America as in Peru, Venezuela, New Granada, Guiana, Brazil, Chile, etc. Masonry is prospering as never before. In the latter republic, the Grand Lodge of this commonwealth has a flourishing subordinate and the Grand Master has just authorized the establishment of another lodge there. On our own continent, our order was never more widely diffused or in a more healthy condition. 
in Mexico. Even respectable lodges are maintained, in despite of the opposition of a bigoted priesthood, and in all British America, and from Newfoundland, through Nova Scotia, and the Canadas, to the icy regions of the North, Masonic lodges and Masonic brethren may be found to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and bind up the wounds of the afflicted. On the condition of the institution in our own country, I need not dwell. Every state and territory, except the unorganized territory of Washington, including even Kansas, has its Grand Lodge, and nearly every considerable town and village its one or more subordinate lodges. If we add to these the large number of chapters, councils, encampments, and other Masonic associations which are spread all over the length and breadth of the land, we have the evidence of a prosperity unparalleled in the annals of any other human institution in any age of the world. Masonry is indeed a universal institution. History does not furnish its parallel. It exists where Christianity has not gone, and its claims will be respected even where the superior claims of religion would fail. It is never obscured by the darkness of night. The eye of day is always upon it. Its footprints are to be traced in the most distant regions and in the remotest ages of the earth. Among all civilized people and in all Christianized lands, its existence is recognized. It came to our shores at an auspicious period, and was here rocked in the cradle of liberty by a Washington, a Franklin, a Hancock, and a Warren, unaffected by the tempest of war, the storms of persecution, or the denunciations of fanaticism. It still stands proudly erect in the sunshine and clear light of heaven, with not a marble fractured, not a pillar fallen. It stands like some patriarchal monarch of the forest, with its vigorous roots riveted to the soul, and the broad limbs spread in bold outline against the sky, and in generations yet to come, as in ages past, the sunlight of honor and renown will delight to linger and play amid its venerable branches. And if ever, in the providence of God, and lashed by storm and riven by lightning, it shall totter to its fall, around its trunks will the ivy of filial affection, that has so long clasped it, still cling, and mantle with greenness, and verdure its ruin and decay. In no sketch of masonry, perhaps should mention of the charities of the order be omitted. Masonic benevolencies are well systematized the world over. Some of them are necessarily public, but the great number are never heard of outside the lodge. It is not the policy of masonry to dispense benevolencies to any but those who actually need them. The order does not, for instance, pay any member a sum of money merely because he is sick. The actual pinch of poverty must be manifest before the coffers of the society are opened, but when want stares a Freemason, his widow or his orphans in the face, they are liberally assisted to tide over their misfortunes. Public Masonic charities take different forms in different countries. In Sweden, 12 work schools in which poor children are taught useful trades are maintained. In Hungary last winter, a daily average of 9,722 poor people were each given a loaf of bread, and at milk depots, numberless children were given each a roll and a pint of hot milk during the rigors of frosty weather. In America, public Masonic charities have largely been in the form of Masonic homes, great institutions in which the aged, widows, and orphans are given a pleasant home because of their connection with the fraternity. A few words in conclusion. It has been the intent of the writer to condense within about a hundred pages such a sketch of Freemasonry as would interest men and women and yield to them correct ideas of the order. If a just account has been given of the legend and tradition of Masonry, of its early manifestations, of the famous attacks upon it, of its teachings and of its extent, the author's purpose has been accomplished. There has been no attempt to make this little book cyclopedic, monitorial, 
Judas prudent, disquisitional, argumentative, or speculative. The whole purpose has been to make the story accurate and brief. For those whose minds may not be content with the primary methods adopted herein, there is a literature which will carry them to the highest pinnacles of Masonic learning in a dozen different branches, and to which they may be directed by any informed member of the fraternity. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.